Hi, this is Ben Atma. I'm here with Carl Frey uh, at Oxford University. And what I want to talk about is this very exciting topic of the future of employment. Um, we are currently experiencing a new industrial revolution. New technologies are coming in to change our world of work. And Carl, you together with uh, your co-author, uh, Michael Osborne wrote a very influential paper, which is now many years ago. It was 2013, is that right? That's right. Yes. So, so says, yes. one of the most quoted studies in this field when it comes to the future of employment. Maybe you can... It's, it's very much quoted, but also very misquoted. <laughs> I, I think there's some scary numbers in there. The headline figure that is often... Um, talked about is that the study predicted that 40, 47 percent of current of, of U.S. jobs could potentially be automated. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that study, maybe what motivated this, the key findings, and 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 what we can learn from that. Sure. Yeah. So what we did back in 2012, or when the pub uh, study was published in 2013, but I think we started to write the paper in 2011 actually. Uh, so what we did is trying to look at how sort of the current pie of employment, how exposed that is to automation as artificial intelligence, mobile robotics, all of these technologies become more pervasive. Yeah. Um, and the economics literature uh, at the time sort of had this dividing line that machines have a comparative advantage and things that are routine and rule based that can easily be specified in computer code from the top down. Uh, but at the time we were seeing a lot of examples of computers doing things that were commonly deemed non-routine like translation work, potentially driving a car, medical diagnostics, uh, you know, general, general um, generative adversarial networks and dreaming up fashion models from thousands of pictures and that sort of stuff. Mm. So that was nothing that you know most people would deem routine. No. So we tried to figure out what this actually means for the future of um, employment mm. um, in terms of looking at the potential scope of automatability from a technological capabilities point of view. Mm. So obviously there's a lot of factors that shape the pace of automation mm. and the extent of automation. So when Nissan produces cars in Japan, it relies heavily on robots. When it does the same thing in India, it relies heavily on sheep labor. And even if Google Translate becomes perfect tomorrow, you still need a, a certified translator for certain documents to be valid. Mm. So unless you certify Google Translate, it's not going to replace the jobs of translators, and, and so on. And so the, the, the headline figure then, those 47, were the, is the possibility of the existing jobs to be automated but what it doesn't say is the jobs that we create right exactly so on the one hand it only looks at the potential automatability of jobs from a technological capabilities point of view and obviously other factors as well like the relative costs of capital legislation and consumer preferences uh, and even potentially worker resistance yeah. shape the pace and extent to which automation will actually happen. Uh, and secondly, it looks at the pie of employment at one given point in time. Yeah. It doesn't consider you know, potentially emerging jobs. And if I were to, to go ask back and ask my uh, great-grandmother if I could travel back in time and ask, what do you think that your great-grandchildren are going to do? She would probably not say that, you know. My son is going to be a hot yoga teacher and my daughter is going to be a software engineer, I think mm. quite unlikely. In a similar fashion, we're in place today to actually try to predict um, what the jobs of the future um, will be. Um, but I think one, one thing that, was, that I do still find concerning is that if we look at what machines are good at, they are spe especially sort of good at doing many tasks performed by low skill, low income workers. Mm. And we've already seen this hollowing out of the labor market, middle income jobs disappearing. Okay. And, and it seems to me that looking forward that many of these sort of safe havens for low skilled workers working as uh, receptionists or security guards or uh, telemarketers, mm. many of those jobs are likely to disappear going forward. 
um, and for people that don't have cognitive skills, um, I think that this looks less likely that those people are likely to prosper in the future labor market. Okay, so if you, what, one of the questions I get asked a lot when, when I do presentations is, how do we prepare for, for this? How would you, what advice would you give to young, young kids today, uh, to people in the labor market maybe that face some risk of their, their jobs being augmented and, and replaced by machines, what, what would you advise those people to do? Yeah, so in the end of the day I'm an academic, I'm not a career advisor, so I usually <laughs> give them that answer. Uh, but clearly, I mean, if you look across departments, right, so in engineering science, we can't keep the people that do machine learning for the full PhD because they, you know, get hired by Facebook and Google and get great jobs. Mm. So obviously if you think that data is the new oil, which is clearly you know, cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason, um, uh, you would think that working with large data sets and doing machine learning and that sort of stuff uh, is going to become a skill of value. Uh, and that's good for people who leave school now who can, you know, study uh, mm. information engineering. Uh, the harder part is for people that lose their jobs later in life and I think we need to ask ourselves does it make sense for somebody at the age of 64 to sort of retrain for a completely new job mm -hmm. or should we rather think about you know subsidizing uh, their employment to some extent so if they drop down from middle income jobs to low income jobs the government could potentially top up some of that income differential mm. uh, and create more incentives, better incentives to work and also uh, reduce uh, levels of inequality and I think education is not going to be the answer to everything, I think it's part of it, uh, but it's not the, the, the entire, entire answer. So you, you, you said a key is the, the middle income um, people where you might don't have a, a college education, um, they are quite at risk. From from your your current experience, where which kind of jobs would you put at the high risk category for, for automation, and which ones would you place at the the lower level? Mm. So I mean, so we found that quite a significant share of jobs are exposed to automation, and it's not like if you looked at the past, it was mainly back office work or production jobs in very structured environments that were exposed to automation. Now we find that everything from jobs in retail, uh, transportation, logistics, uh, construction, uh, sales, uh, the, the, the sort of potential uh, scope mm -hmm. uh, extends across almost every mm -hmm. uh, uh, industry uh, and domain. And if you think about, for example, uh, you know, in the United States, there are 3.5 million people still working as uh, cashiers. If you go mm -hmm. to an Amazon Go store, uh, you won't see a single one. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that those people won't find new work, but it's, I think, the sort of tendency, and we do find, see a very sort of uh, strong uh, negative correlation between skills, income, and jobs as susceptibility to automation, it is uh, on balance the low skill, low income jobs that are most exposed to automation. And we also know from past studies that those are the people who struggle the most to adjust. Mm. So if you, so in, in, in terms of the, the job skills that you find are least susceptible to automation, what, what are some of the, the key examples right. there? Yeah, so the basis of our study is that we actually consider three key bottlenecks to automation. So we're saying that despite all these advances in artificial intelligence and other robotics, uh, what are domains in which computers still perform poorly? Uh, and one such domain is clearly complex social interactions, uh, which were highlighted in the paper. And I think it was a year or two after, um, so we'd argue that no uh, chatbot had performed well in uh, Logan Prize competitions, those are essentially Turing test competitions where mm -hmm. chatbots try to convince human judges of them being a person. And, and I think 
two years after we published our study, there was a breakthrough and one chatbot actually managed to convince 30% of human judges of its being a person. Mm. Uh, but it did so by pretending to be a 13 year old Russian orphan <laughs> boy, speaking English as a second language with no understanding of English culture. Uh, and this is basic text communication, right? So even you know, uh, if, 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 if computers become perfect or text communication, there's still so many sort of in-person type of interactions uh, that are hard to automate when we try to sort of motivate our colleagues and mm -hmm. persuade somebody that we're right about something and mm -hmm. uh, so on. Uh, so that's one bottleneck. Uh, another bottleneck has to do with um, creative type of work and mm -hmm. there's a big debate in the machine learning a community as to whether computers can be creative. Um, I think that most people that say that they can or are, or you should never say that they can't be, if, if, if you don't think that we're anything else than sort of just a composition of atoms, you should think that it should potentially be possible mm. at some point, but I think it's quite far off and I think the people that argue that computers are creative already tend to conflate novelty with the creativity. Mm. So I could draw something on the wall here and call myself an artist, right? But uh, you know, you would be quite unlikely to, to, to buy my painting and the hard part is to arrive at something that is novel mm. uh, uh, that actually also makes sense. Mm. And novelty is not, not the tricky part. Um, and the, the last bottleneck has to do with the perception and manipulation of irregular objects and navigating complex environments. So for us, it's quite easy to distinguish between an important document on the floor and a sort of piece of rubbish. Uh, but so conceptually, if you think about uh, having an automated cleaner, it's actually not that straightforward. Mm -hmm. And other things like a pot that is dirty and needs to be clean and a pot that holds a plant mm -hmm. right, to, to toss, actually not so easy to, to, to explain. And I think uh, uh, one thing that we argue in the paper is that the automated cleaner is one of the last things we go. I guess so. So cleaners, Sadly. plumbers, I think are a yeah. great example. Yeah. Um, where you need the dexterity, the understanding of complex environments, where you have a, a new job challenge every day. That's yeah, right. very good. Very good. Thank you. That was useful. Um, thank you very much for your time. Carl. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.